All right, welcome back to another edition of the Dirty Verdict Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Peter Taft. And I'm the second host, Bill Ogden. We are missing our third amigo, Kyle Herbert, who is uh, in the process of damaging his other knee. I'm not missing him. Ski. Okay, I am missing him. We're missing his humor and lighthearted touch. So, Kyle, we'll see you next week. So we've got a very special guest. Well, they're all special, but this, this is a very special guest. Uh, Anthony also. Anthony, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we'll, what we thought we'd do is talk a little bit about your background, and uh, we try to try to be useful, but one, just be interesting, but also useful to younger lawyers for, you know, kind of where you've gotten to where you've gone and how you chose your career. So we'll kind of go through that. And then you've had a recent uh, kind of a public uh event that you're a part of that we'll get into in some detail and then maybe talk some legal news with the group okay all right well very good so where where are you from from houston uh obviously i'm only a four-year lawyer so i can i can only impart so much wisdom in that amount of time onto a young lawyer but uh from houston i went to south texas college of law i think that's your alma mater as well it is um graduated in 18 december and then went right into the district attorney's office so, and I don't know if you guys knew, my dad's a lawyer too, same name. So that was always kind of the motivating factor for me to get into law. Um, and I worked there for four years until I ended up meeting Dan on a case and joined his law firm. And I think it was day two of the job. He goes, do you want to be involved in the impeachment? <laughs> As if I like had a choice to say no. Uh, and I said, yes, and then had that trial. So it's been definitely been fast paced in the past four and a half years as far. So your your father is a criminal defense lawyer? He is. So uh, he predominantly, I mean, over time, found his niche. He is one of the few guys that does capital murder defense. Um, on the appointment side? On the appointment side. Yeah. There's only like five of them. Yeah. I mean, most of the time, capital murder, you're gonna they're going to be appointed cases. Um, he actually just picked up that Orapisa case, which is a multi- it was a multi-killing up in San Jacinto County. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, excuse me, that alleged to kill all his neighbors. So that's been. Wait, is this the one where they, they were like from Honduras, and he like they, they were having like a party, and then went in and like killed a bunch of people in the house? Uh, I don't know the specifics. That he might be. He the guy. The, I think the guy was on the run for a few days. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the one I'm thinking of. Um, so every time like on TikTok, they confuse me for him actually, and they'll like post me as a background speaking Spanish, which I don't speak Spanish, unfortunately. Uh, and they're talking about the war visa case. So just in, they're like, man, yeah, that also guy, he doesn't age. What's high. <laughs> <laughs> is he a, is he a solo practice? Solo practice. And how long has he been doing that? Uh, 40 years. I know Dan. So I work for Dan Conville now. Uh, and Dan and my dad were in law school at the same time. I think graduated in 80, I want to say 82 or 83. So, yeah, probably about almost 40 years of actually practicing law. Um, and my mom was a lawyer, too. She stopped practicing after her fourth child, but she practiced criminal defense all the way through 2000. Huh. Yeah. Okay, so you obviously grew up seeing that, and did you? was there ever a thought of doing anything else, or did you just know you wanted to be a lawyer? You know, it's funny. Um None of my siblings are lawyers. Like, I think parents coming home talking about aggravated robbery, capital murder, sexual assault for two decades can either just steer you right towards it or right away from it. Um, but the trial element of it all was always, that was always attractive. Like, you know, as you walk into a courtroom, it's just interact. And I always liked that. I think in college, I studied finance and thought, maybe I don't want to do a crime the rest of my life. And uh, then I went back to, we had talked about earlier, actually, I, I worked in Judge Velasquez's court. I know you worked there. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. And uh, I watched Maverick Ray do a trial. He probably doesn't remember this, but I actually was clicking like the numbers, how he would rate his jury, whether he should keep a juror or not, which I totally messed up. I don't think, <laughs> I don't know if that affected his case. And it was that summer that I said, no, you know what? This is what I want to do. I'm going to go back to law school or go to law school all the way. So you interned during your college years? I did. I interned, well, when I was an undergraduate, I interned with Judge Velasquez. In law school, I was a um, 
I was a post-conviction writs enter. So basically, you know, after appeals and the criminal side of things, you get the writ of habeas corpus. My job was to answer the basically per se denial cases okay. that people would follow. And I mean, and these are handwritten and they don't make any sense. I go on for yeah. ages. Tell that to Gideon. Yeah, true. I have a first edition Gideon's trumpet. Of the book? Yep. And was his petition, this is the uh, the case that established the right to an attorney, counsel, no matter what your finances are, Correct. Gideon versus Wainwright. So is you have the book. I do. And it's got like... Uh, the, the middle pages have like pictures of the actual handwritten real yeah. that he did. Yeah. Where do you think the original is? It's got to be in some I, museum. That's, I would assume it's probably in the Smithsonian. I feel like it's a pretty big piece of American history. So constitutional history. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like one of the, one of the ones. So did you ever approve or pass along or up the chain, any of these handwritten writs? I was, if, if it's, if they think that a judge is going to approve it, it wasn't going into my heads. <laughs> I think, like, I think the first time after, it was a weird time to be an intern because Harris County, I went to school. Yeah, so y- y'all didn't have a courthouse. No. I, I actually left, or a DA's office. I left, the D- I left my internship. I actually did a civil internship with Purdue and Kid. Oh, I know Don. Real, I, I, I don't Don's intern. Don's, Don's a close friend. He's the one that got me tied up in that, uh, that $70 million verdict, the negligent discharge of a firearm, literally his idea on a golf course. He's like, ah, there's a case you can use. And, you know, Don Kidd, thanks, thanks a lot, Don. <laughs> Good lawyer. I, oh, he's fantastic. I, uh, you know, and I don't even know if he remembers that. I was there for literally a semester. Um, I met him through, like, South Texas Advocacy. And, I, you know, y'all talked about this before, but that first internship in any civil practice – you're not getting anything super interesting. No, you're 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 making notebooks. You are making notebooks and highlighting. I can't see although that. although at a plaintiff's firm, you typically are seeing a little more. Yeah, at a plaintiff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. I, and, and I like that. I just wait. So you were probably there during his Remington verdict. Uh, I don't know if you're there long enough. He he had a big uh, uh, Remington uh, discharge, product liability discharge, wrongful discharge, and killed somebody. He tried it. Came. I I, th- I want to say I, I went to their office before that okay but I'm not positive. COVID yeah. messed up my timeline so now everything's like everything is like seven-ish years ago right like I can't really tell anymore yeah well, Harvey then COVID and then yeah so no knock on your experience on the civil side you just really you knew you wanted to be criminal lawyer I mean I well you have to my father's never steered me to be a lawyer except for every day of my life, he was steering me to be a lawyer. And I think he didn't care because I'm a prosecutor. My dad is a lifelong defense attorney. So when I did that, it didn't bother. And, and it's not like going down another line of work would bother him, but um, when I took that internship, he was like, hmm. The <laughs> civil one or the DA's? The, the civil one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I, I like the courtroom element of it. But I, it seems like, I mean, every time I'm on social media, there's a huge trial with a huge verdict. Uh, yeah. There's truly no lack of action on either side. They're out there. I, I think that, the di- especially Harris County, the dynamics change over the last five years for sure. Um, there's a lot of nine-figure verdicts coming out now. Before, I couldn't really think of many. And more trials or just? I think trials are, pre-COVID, we were still having way more, or pre-Harvey, way more trials than we are now. Um, and I think that's a mixture of a little bit of playing catch up, people got used to it. Right. And then also I think the new realm of judges may play a factor in that as well. I will say this. I, I think the biggest draw to going criminal for me was that's quick access to trials. A lot of what you can deny going and being a prosecutor, whether you just want to wear the white cape and, and fight crime the rest of your career or whether you really just want to go get trial experience, you're going to try a case. And so that was my philosophy. Um, and it was a weird time with the like Harvey happening, huge backlogging cases, COVID happening. So you had a huge turnover rate in the DA's office. It was really easy to like move up the ranks and try a lot of cases at the DA's office. So that was a great experience. So, I mean, as far as advice to younger attorneys, finding a job that's going to get you in the courtroom as soon as possible, I think that's the best place to learn. And so 
two questions. How did you get your job at the Harris County DA's office? One and two, what would you what what would you recommend to someone who wants to do that in their starting law school or even in undergrad to enhance their chances of landing that mm-hmm. premier job? So I can't deny that that having I have the same name as my dad. He's been in the game for a long time. So that for me was access to a lot of contacts. But I met um through my time at the Growing up, I knew Judge Velasquez, and she got me into the courtroom, and I met a lot of lawyers on the prosecutor's side, and a guy named Andrew Smith, who was, um, he was a section chief in post-conviction writs. That's another thing. Not a great, I don't think of myself as a great writer, so for me, that was an opportunity to practice writing, and practice legal research, and uh, met with him, got the internship, and I worked there for two and a half years. So at that point, they knew me and knew the quality of work. And that was how I got my job. I think as a, if you're coming up and you want to find a, a job at the DA's office, well, I mean, I, we can't deny the, the turnover at the DA's office right now is really bad. So they're, uh, what, what, le- are they losing people at all levels? At all levels. I, I, so I work, it's, so I work with Dan and then the other associate at our firm is, uh, Sean Tier, who's, mm-hmm. you know, Kim's opponent, uh, and that's Kim Og, the current DA. Her, yeah. her is Sean. Sean's running in the Republican side. No, he's yes. Okay, got it. All right. Primary. He's her opponent. It's like, you know, I think he's got a good shot. I think that obviously Kim Og has a lot of name brand recognition, and she's the incumbent. But Sean's making a buzz. I, he's raised, I think, almost like seven and change like uh, you know i think he's really raised a lot of money so um he left i left but i can name i mean people were leaving when I, after i left i know three other like chief level prosecutors that left the office which is a big deal it takes time to get there you're losing experienced people so um there's definitely a turnover rate are, are they going into criminal defense or civil so there's a split. You've got a lot of people that left and went to other prosecutors' offices, which is that's a, that's your biggest problem. If you're hmm. losing DAs to lower paying DA jobs because they don't like who they're working for, then that's an issue. Um, and then a lot of people decided they wanted to do defense. It's more conducive for their lifestyle, and they've been prosecutors for a long time. And also, you can make a little bit more money on the defense side. A little bit, yeah. And for me, it was just Dan and I had a case to get against each other. So the so as far as my time in the DA's office, you know, you rise up the ranks. So I was a misdemeanor prosecutor. Um, you get you you go to trial bureau, and then I moved into human trafficking, which basically I was responsible for like meeting with all the girls charged with prostitution at the time, and I put them in diversion programs. Good for you. I don't I don't think this is a good guy. I can tell you, I didn't convict a single girl of prostitution. Yeah. Really, we that. Tell that to Maverick. <laughs> oh, I know. I saw that. Yeah. So I'm still not okay with it. And these are typically the, the people you're dealing with. They are at massage parlors and there's a big group. I mean, it's just very because You've got, you had the time. Like, I think I met with 115 women charged with prostitution. Mm-hmm. A lot of, a lot of the time you had street prostitution. You had online sales. I think we, you saw that article about, uh, back page. Right. That was a huge source. Like, and part of the diversion was they had to meet with myself and a social worker, uh, female, obviously. And yeah, back page was huge. And then street, I mean, it's Houston. So you had street walker prostitution as well. Um, but that's not who they were after. They were after pimps. Yeah. So I was for the, exactly. whatever we call them. I don't, I don't even know how to PC that one. Yeah. I don't think they've made a PC term for that. Yeah. I don't think it is. I feel like if Snoop's got a whole song about it and so does Jay-Z, we can say it. Yeah. Okay. So that was, so that was rewarding, I assume. It was. And then from there you go to felony and um, that's when it gets fun. That's when you're, you have the opportunity to either, I mean, you're dealing with serious cases, right? Your sexual assault, sexual assault of children and murder. And I think that's when you meet a victim and you start to understand, okay, this is why I'm a prosecutor or this is why I'm doing what I do. And that's not to say that every case results in a conviction because there's oftentimes investigations are rushed. I think 
I've learned working for Dan in the past two months more about that than, than I really knew. And, uh, so, but you get the opportunity to really deal with more high stakes cases. And then final year, I was a domestic violence prosecutor. I just dealt with any domestic violence homicide or high profile domestic violence case. And Dan and I had a case against each other. And he said, why don't we go meet for a drink? Uh, then talk about not the case figured that meant possibly in working for Dan and it worked out. So, and when was that that you joined Dan? I joined Dan in, well, I, I first day at his office was July 5th of this year of this year. Okay. Two months before Paxton. So what, so when did, when did Paxton get put on your radar? Like, Hey, by the way, you're going to be in Austin for a month or whatever it was, two weeks. Day, he walks in my office. He's, do you have any interest in, Working on the Paxton case, which the answer there's really only one answer. It's not a question. Not a question. Yeah, and of course I was interested in working on that case, and we didn't even have the discovery at that point. That's what was that was one of the insane things about preparing that case for trial, is that we got a discovery order signed. I want to say it might have been right before I got there, mm -hmm. like, but it was it was late summer, and. Then we just get production rolling. So the first day, and in, in criminal world, you're not getting thirty thousand page dumps. You might in a cell phone, but you're not you're not getting records like you might in a civil case. At least not at the. Do they produce them all in PDF or like in a TIFF to where y'all can upload them into a platform? Uh, a TIFF, you were able to upload them. I, I didn't. I hadn't worked with Relativity or anything like that yeah. at the time. I worked for the state for four years. <laughs> you don't get relative. You <laughs> Yeah, he's got his folder, individual folders, old school. Uh, two associates that were working on the case for Tony Busby at the time. We'd meet up on at night on the weekends and just roll through docs. So we we'd gone through about who was it? Ruth? No, she she, she came on later. She, she did come on later. Who? Which was th I was thankful for that. It was Colby Haller and Anthony Dolcefino. Got it. And I was glad to have those guys. You know, because we were just doing a long doc review. It's good to have. No, yeah, it's good to have a good atmosphere and, and letting them, you know, hey, I'm reading this. What do you think about? Do you think it's important or not? Um, we went through probably 45,000 and we're like, oh, that's tough. And then the production has just kept going. I was about to say 45,000, that's dropping the bucket. I mean, yeah, like you're, we're dealing with like 45,000 documents. Some of those are 500 pages. Well, we probably had close to, it was 300,000 pages. That's not bad. I mean, if you got, yeah, that's doable. I mean, but we had a ton. We had, if we got, if we started getting them in July, we had two months to go through them all. Yeah, it's kind of. That, it, it, yeah, if you've got anything else on your plate, that can be tough. Was the Paxton case kind of the impetus for Dan needing good help? You know, I. We haven't had that conversation. I, I want to say I, I will say this. I felt like I was useful. Like I think that he, you know, you know, if, if he's watching, I think you were lucky to have me. <laughs> but no, I. I I just think there was a lot going on at the time. He was really Yeah, I was going to ask what the time frame was. So he restarted his firm. And yeah, I think the timing was there. I think he recognized that an extra set of hands would be good. Just So at, you're going through discovery. When do you find out, hey, you're going to be talking? You're going to be asking some questions. Again, it was one of those uh, kind of Dan walk in the room. I was working in a conference because we're, we were in a temporary office while we were getting, we just moved into golf building or the old, uh, old chase building. Oh yeah. Sure. It is downtown. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So we weren't set up and I'm, I'm at a conference table in like a temp office and he walks in and he's like, you know, if you want to have, take any witnesses, go ahead. Uh, at that time he was, he had a couple people in mind. Um, Don Clemmer was involved in it. He was, a uh, he was at the DA's office, so he was a part of one of the allegations regarding hiring Brandy Kamick, um, or them referring the case for Brandon Kamick to investigate. The special special prosecutor issue. Right. Uh, which he didn't have a, a lot to say, I don't think. And then, so I was preparing for him, but it sort of just morphed where we were, you know, when you're preparing for trial, you identify who are going to be the big players involved. Um, and it, I was preparing Ryan Basser and Ryan Beggar heavily. Um, 
Ryan Va- and I write crosses for him and, and pass work product along. That's one of the things I thought, just a thought that I had as a young lawyer working in that case, I'm working with Dan Cogdell, who obviously has a really notorious background. Um, and he's been doing it for a while. He practically has his own TV docudrama right now. Mm-hmm. He, he does. Who, who stars as him? Oh, uh, Giovanni Rishi. Yeah. yeah. Who I thought, you know, did a great, did a good job. I can see it. Like when he does certain things, you can kind of see if you watch Dan, you can see the little mannerism. resemblance. No, no, zero physical. I mean, Dan's a walking Texas encyclopedia too. Like the amount of one-liners that he can just zip off. It's it, there was yeah. one, something about a bucket of hay or something like that. I was like, I haven't heard that one before. Six foot six without the steps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, with well, we heard some of them in in the uh, Paxton trial. Some some of which were more colorful than others. Just just to plug it because uh, for anyone who hadn't, we've talked about it before. But it's Waco, what is it, The Siege or something? What's the name of the show? That- so Waco Aftermath is the second season. Yeah. Where yeah. you, which both, so it's funny, one after, one, the first season is on, I think it's on Showtime. Second season is on another platform. It's like FX or something or Paramount or something. Yeah. Yeah. Don't it, is, it is for any lawyers and say it is very good. Oh, yeah. For low Man, seasons. It can be good for non-lawyers. Yeah. Like. Law and Order fans or whatever. Some other you get Rocket Rosens in there. Yeah, Doug Tinker's in there. So like you, you it it does track uh, some definite uh, legends in the criminal game. Rocket. So so one of Rocket's daughters was in our section with Maverick and me, and and so when it came time for Branch Davidian's case in law school, he came and spoke to our class about it. And like halfway through, he was like, "Yeah," and Courtney was asking me questions the other day about this, and it was like a problem that our teacher was like. You're not allowed outside help. He just no. ratted her out completely. Everybody's like, whoa. And it was, Professor Moses wasn't the coolest guy. So, yeah, it made everything kind of awkward for her. But he was a, he, you talk about somebody that believes in what he did. And he died a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, but he teared up and choked up talking about it 25, 30 years later. Like, he still was not okay with how it all went down. Who was his client? I can't remember off the top of my head, but he, it, I, I remember that, one or two of them, they were like UK citizens. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. And then they Friends did their time, got out, and then immediately got deported. He was really pissed off about that too. So, yeah. I mean, the whole, the way that whole thing shook down. But we, yeah, we, you, you were starting to say you were working with Dan Cogdill and other, just when, you know, when you're a young lawyer and you're, you're putting together a work product for somebody, um, I mean, it's your, you're, you're taking it upon yourself. What do I think is going to be a good cross-examination? What do I think is going to be a good point that's going to stick out to a jury? And I think that for a second, you might second-guess yourself. Oh, I'm young. I'm a, I'm, I'm a younger lawyer. Maybe I don't know what's right and what's wrong. And, and then to myself, I'm like, you know what? Just put it together exactly like you would have done it as a prosecutor, um, obviously from the defense perspective, and hand it to them and see what they think sticks and what they don't. And so... Uh, I just found that to be nerve wracking. Like, like the whole the whole experience was, um, and I'll, I think I'll be a better lawyer for having gone through it. Um, but and like Tony Busby as well, you've got opposing counsel, you've got Dick Daguerre, and you've got Rusty Harden. So I was when I was getting ready for that trial. Um, I mean, that was a lot of hours where I was putting in, just being very meticulous about what points do I want to make. But I really focused on Ryan Banger a lot and. The house actually never interviewed him prior to trial, so everything that I was using to try and create impeachable points against him was like just ancillary documents or other people's statements. Interview. Yeah, and we roll up to trial, and they release their witness list for the first day of trial. And Tony talked about this. He he asked for and got some rule where you got advance notice of who they were going to call, yeah, like night before or something like that. Uh, a lot of motions were filed in, in before trial. I, I, you know, Dana, there were definitely varying viewpoints on how you had, you had two different big personalities, big personalities on the legal team. To say, that's the safe way to say it. Yeah. And a couple of people, like, I, I really would like to say, you know, M- Mitch Little, uh, was one of the lawyers on our legal team. He did a fantastic job. I think. Aside from his cross-examination of um, Ryan Vassar, just 
he, the way he worked up the documents was really impressive because a lot of this stuff we were trying to figure out within the month leading up to trial, like actually ascertain what the, how's this all work? What's their, what right. was their story? What was their story? What was their story? What's their theory? What are they coming at us with? I thought that the actual articles of information were pretty vague. I mean, it was confusing. That's the indictment or the equivalent. Um, so, so Mitch did a great job and, and, uh, Chris Hilton and Judd Stone were sort of our paper tiger guys that were filing all those motions, but they did a really good job at just bringing us all the information and putting together a thoughtful defense of the case. So, who did you end up cross-examining? Ryan. Beck. And what is what was Ryan's role in the whole story? He, I think of him as like the consignment. You know, it, it, what was his job? The fixer. Where, was he in the... So his official title was Deputy First Assistant Attorney General. And I found out that I would be crossing him. I, I kind of knew down deep, it's like there's a big chance I could cross this guy. And I knew that they were going to call him. I thought the fact that he didn't have an interview with the House meant that I, I think that he probably, his attorney probably advised him not to talk about what he was going to, you know, probably advised him not to. And when you say his attorney, the one that Mr. Sutton, who represented yeah, John, everyone, right. um, I just think that I, I think, I, I saw that as a way for the prosecution to put forth evidence without and catch us on our back foot. Um, and so for me, I felt like he knew a lot. He was mentioned a lot. He had a lot of alleged high level conversations. And so I focused a lot on him. And I remember we were sitting at the hotel and uh, it was Dan, Mitch, and Tony, and we got the witness list. And Ryan Banger was second. And my heart kind of was bouncing a little bit. You know, because I knew I was going to be going uh, day one of trot, And that's how I found out that I was certainly taking Ryan. So when you, that morning, are you, are you scared? Are you nervous? All of the above? Like what was you, what are you, because you're four years into this career. You're in the Senate floor with every senator from the state. And then the Mount Rushmore of the greatest attorneys of all time, and you're the one, you're the attorney standing up talking. It's like, yeah. what's going through your mind? And a bunch of cameras. And yeah, and streamed. Yeah. yeah. We're not going to call it Mr. President. Well, that's what they, that's what they... I heard your honor, Mr. President. We, we heard a bunch of different ways. Say, you know, it's not in my DNA to send Mr. President. Uh, I said judge, so. Or governor. Tip. <laughs> which people don't know. You call the Senate governor. Yeah, governor. You can. Yeah. Honor. I call him LT. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say yeah. as far, LTG. As far as the emotions that I experienced, I wouldn't say scared. Scared is not it. Um, I have tried, I've tried 22 cases in my career and they range from DWI to murder to the third impeachment in the state of Texas. So it's a very random and kind of array of cases. But in the past year, I this year I've already tried four murder cases. And okay. So I was in, I think you, you know, you know how it is when you, when you're on a roll in trial, um, you're used to it. I just hadn't been on that, that platform. Right? No one had, no, no, nobody alive in the state had been on that platform. <laughs> so, so I, was, I was definitely nervous. And, and, and I'll be honest, I get nervous in any trial. Good, me too. I get ter I get super anxious. I think you, I think when you lose that. So it keeps me sharp. It keeps you sharp. It's like, it, it, I mean, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? You're just on your, you're on edge. You're not going to fall asleep at the wheel. And I, and you take it seriously still. So to me, I hope I don't lose that emotion. Cause I think I, I'm happy to take that into any case. I try <laughs> obviously 10 questions in. Yeah. Can. Yeah. You're a your train's moving at that point. I can a couple of questions because there's varying styles, right? I, I never want to just attack a witness out of the gate unless they have asked for it, and I know I have the jury's permission to do it. But otherwise, I try to get a couple of yes questions that where they're friendly with me, and uh, and then I'll start getting into the meat of it. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm just I wouldn't say scared. I would say I was nervous and excited. Like in my head, I'm thinking, "Holy shit, <laughs> I'm about to actually talk in this." Yeah, you're like the way you look at it is probably. You're, I don't know, two decades ahead of everybody you went to law school with at this point. I mean, I wouldn't say that. There's some good, there's some good lawyers, and and I think they're 
they're great lawyers. Like there's certain things that I don't do great that other lawyers do great. But as far as magnitude of moments in this profession, nobody even holds your I mean water. Dan, when when we got the verdict at the end, Dan said, cherish it, don't get used to it. <laughs> you get about you might get one of these every twenty years in this game. Yeah. So I took that to heart. But uh, it was a feeling of excitement and it was also a feeling of responsibility. I think when you talk about what was going on, you know, Ken's job is online. So that was big to me. I thought that, um, and based on my review of all the facts, I felt like I, I didn't think it warranted impeachment. And I know a lot of people have varying opinions on that, but political affiliation aside, like I just felt like there wasn't enough there for the impeachment. But on top of that, I just got hired by Dan. You know, Dan Dan literally said, I just gave you a really fast car, don't wreck it. And then Tony's like, hmm, are you, oh, you taking that witness? So there's a lot of pressure to want to perform for the guys I'm working with. 100%. And a lot of our co-counsel's jobs were all Like the people that had, had uh, temporarily resigned from the AG's office to, and helped on the dross. A lot of the, uh, you know, especially in our case in chief, we had a lot of OAG employees that took to leave or yeah yeah to try the case because they believed in it super risky and i respect them for for rolling the dice like that but uh i don't know if it's that risky if you win you win if you lose the new ag is probably gonna clear the slate and bring in their own people anyway so i guess that's right but there is like a there was risk yeah there was and uh and so i took that seriously you know i wanted them i wanted to do right by them so how about crossing, I mean, in your, you, you tried these four murder cases and that's very high. I mean, that's losing a job is one thing, losing your life or someone lost their life and then someone else may lose their life or at least be locked up a long time. But probably the witnesses are not probably the smartest people in the world. Whereas you are crossing someone who. Fantastic that, attorneys. Yeah. That, <laughs> that AG's office did attract some of the smartest people, at least law school, the highest performers in law school. Uh, so how did you approach that cross differently than you would, you know, someone in a murder case who's in the that world? You can't swing for the fences. Like that is that was the biggest thing with uh, Ryan Banger was you've got a guy that was a partner at I want to say Bracewell, but I might be wrong. It might be Fulbright or I just a big good firm, big good firm, um, and he was a division chief equivalent at the office of attorney general and then was promoted to be the first assistant attorney general. And that's a big role in the state of Texas. So everything that I did, any point that I tried to make, I really wanted to double down and make sure that I knew exactly what I was talking about. And if finally, when I was into the cross long enough, I got to a point where there was a point where I even realized that maybe I didn't have a hundred percent grasp on the on the content, and you just zoom out, zoom in. I had I had an outline. Obviously, you don't read every question off of it, but I I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe that's not the point that I make, but here's where I can try and get him and establish um, a lack of credibility. So, and, and that's the thing. He's Ryan Baggert's not going to be. You, you're not going to catch him in a huge lie and a huge conspiracy. Um, I think that there were things that I was able to do to match his credibility. And so, like I said earlier, taking it slow at the beginning and then just identifying what you have him on that you can tie him to with a document and a yes or no answer. That was kind of my strategy with him. Whereas in a, in a murder trial, you're going to have, sometimes you'll have psychologists that'll take the stand. You'll have, um, I've had biomechanical engineers that want to talk about trajectories of bullets and things like that. And other times you've got an eyewitness or a character witness, or you have the defendant. And so similar to Ryan Bangert, you're going to treat the psychologist and the biomechanical engineer um, a lot more delicately than you will the defendant that you know you can trip up easily. But the thing about Ryan Bangert on top of that is that he's a lawyer and has probably been in my shoes to an extent. So he knows exactly what... Been in your shoes... 15 years ago when he was, you know, right. So he knows what, he knows what I'm trying to do. I mean, it's, it was a very, it was a very tense 
felt like a tense intellectual battle with him. Well, one thing is, I'm thinking about it, really composure and presence and uh, your temperament to me is is important because like I'm thinking through my view on you, I didn't know how old you were or how long you've been practicing. I thought you were way older, by the way. <laughs> uh, that is a compliment. No, you should. I thought you, I thought you, I thought it was impressive the way you handled it, especially at fucking 29. Thank you. But you were, you just, you, you were very earnest and unflappable. And, you know, I, for me to invest in knowing, you know, what day the carpenter came around, I'm not going to do that. I'm really thinking, okay, I'm looking at composure and tone and, uh, presence. And so you were good, and I don't really know what happened, although I just was like, hey, Anthony did well with his witness. Well, I did that. Yeah. Twitter loved you. Yeah. When the fe female aspect of Twitter really loved you. Because I, like, I went on that night of your day one, and they all they talked about, they didn't care about the witnesses. They were like, did you see that? Did you see that in a lawyer, though? Did you see that also, Glenn? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, I feel sorry for that guy's DMs because they're filling out. I was, who did all right. <laughs> and yeah, well, that, that was one positive uh, yeah. aspect. And then like Jeff Mateer, by all accounts, this is not my view. I think this is consensus. He, his demeanor and presence was not very strong. And that's why a lot of people no. thought maybe the case was over after Tony's cross-exam of him, even though clearly brilliant guy and very accomplished, he just... His demeanor on the witness stand was not very confident and strong. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I Ryan Banger felt like a stronger. Personally, I feel like he was one of their strongest. He's just not gonna waffle. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, and and I also think that he was rose up the ranks to handle a lot of the things that maybe um, Mateer, you know, I don't want to say wasn't because I, but I think Ryan Banger moved up to get stuff done. Yeah, he's a little more of a practical yeah. kind of person. He's a fixer. Yeah, because Tony, I think, <laughs> talked about this in his, like, he will do this where the, I will know, because I've been in trial with him, I'll know the, he asks a question and the answer is not helpful to him. Uh, if you're purely looking at putting evidence in little buckets and you want it on your bucket, but Tony will do something to make it sound like, oh, that's exactly what I wanted you to say. And the jury's like, oh, that must be, Tony must have won. Yeah. So that was, that's one of the, we had different, like I said, there were two strong personalities on the case. Um, I tend to follow the Condell sort of discipline. And I think on certain criminal cases, when you're, you know, you're at half and you're 35 points down, you have, you can't, you can't, you have to be a little bit more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say methodical because I'm not saying that Tony Busby's not methodical. You just have to play it different. There's two. Yeah. Your, your the style. I, you got to, yeah, you just, there's the like kind of the loose style and then you got to tighten up at times and play it, you know, close to the chest. So I think that those are the two different. Yeah. Like I thought that you had Tony style and then I, I went after Tony. We're, we were very different. Mm -hmm. Super calm. I think, I think one of the, uh, one of the news outlets compared myself and Ryan Baker to Patrick Bateman and Paul Allen arguing over their business cards, which I love that scene, wouldn't necessarily want to be compared to him. Yeah, it'd be like, yeah, like, total psychopath. Came off like a murderer, serial killer. Sounded like a murderer. Sounded like a murderer. But then you had Mitch Little, who was fiery out of the gate with with Ryan Vassar. And then you followed up with Dan, which I loved uh, because Dan slow bait, he was slow baiting. You talking about the Ranger? The Ranger, you know. And Ranger, Ranger, and six foot six without the Stetson, and he—I don't care what what side of the ball you're on. People, especially in that courtroom, tend to want to agree with Ranger Maxwell. That's just where they're at. So you can't you can't go out of the gate trying to throw haymakers at him. You had to bait him in, and I thought it made Dan switch when he got the Ranger to admit. He's me yeah, he's messing with them. Like, yeah, I I mean that was epic. So so you guys are working a little right brain left brain attack. So you guys are I can't know what side is the emotional, what side is the analytical, but y'all are hitting both sides of the, of the brain with this. Yeah, good. Well, I'll say this, and this, Bill, um, for lawyers like you that are senior at your firm, I always thought this. You'd have the at, at particularly at big firms, you'd have the associate who reviewed all the documents, or then on a brief like reviewed all the uh, cases and wrote the brief. And so having reading 
read the cases, they know like what the theories are and like kind of the rationale for why the judge. And then they hand that to a partner who's like, I'm going to go argue that. And they skim it. Yeah. I, well, I've talked about it on the show. I'm like, if, if your young lawyers write it, if you trust them to do the research and write it, trust them to argue it. Yeah. And they so can do I it better. Give Dan hats yeah, he, for that, for having He probably listened to the show, to took my advice. So <laughs> you're welcome. I, I, I told him we went to the cloakroom after, um, and I, I can't put into words how thankful I am. He goes, no, you fucking can't. <laughs> That's damn. Okay, sounds good. Just buy me the next shrink. Yeah. Mm. So I was a bartender at the cloakroom really, really? one summer. Yeah. You look like a cloakroom bartender. He, he's not drinking, but we, we, he would take me for a drink and we, I love that bar. That was a great place. It's a classic. There used to be a lady named Margaret who would play the piano in there at night. And there's back when you could smoke it. Not that I smoked, but people smoked in we bars. Won't. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I just knew they smoked because I would come home after bartending and I would reek because everyone in there smoked. It used to be, it, I went back there six months ago and it was very clean, no smoke, no, no, uh, piano player, but it's still a cool bar. Well, nice. I was telling, I was telling you, um, that we, uh, just telling Bill that we owned, my family owned Nikki's Irish pub for 30 oh. years. Where's that? It's right off, you know, Brenner Steakhouse, mm -hmm. East Road, East, if you're on I-10, yeah. eastbound feeder, just before Bellway 8. My father-in-law had a dental building right next to Brenner's that after he died, the later he's bought it and knocked it down. It's a parking lot now. Oh, really? But it was right next door to Brenner's. I think I knew, well, I knew, I think I knew where that dental clinic was. Yeah. And you got Brenner's and there's a fertility clinic. And then there's our bar, which is, which at one point was Sakura Modeling Spa, which was a prostitution ring. Uh, you could get a fake ID, a tattoo. This is not your bar. No, no, no. These are just the bar. Not the current bar. Yeah, I was going to say. They speak of. Gotcha. Yeah. No, these are just the businesses in the strip center around the bar. Yeah, that strip center. What else is it? Well, what's in there now? Now it's a chop shop, a laundromat, novelty. Uh, no, it's it's a comedy driving, like, a, like you know, ticket defense. And it's on I-10. <laughs> on I-10. So this incredibly expensive piece of dirt has had the... <laughs> The Nikki's Irish Pub is the anchor tenant. Y'all don't know it anymore. No, as of a month ago. So oh, okay, but um, I I just remember the days where you could smoke in the bar. Like I, it was yeah. yeah, it's they you could. I went to Sam Houston. You can probably still smoke in two of those bars. Well, like I went back like four years ago, and they, it was completely legal. I was like, oh, this is what it smelled like when I was here. It was bad. You already could go Headwood Village. You go, remember that restaurant? You could go. <laughs> you could smoke in there. Have a smoke. I love how it's like smoking or non-smoking. When you used to get a reservation, you're like non-smoking. There wasn't a wall. It was just like no, I, a, another room with an opening. And like there was not. It all smelled like smoke. Yeah, I'm older. I'm older than y'all. When I was a kid, you go on flights and there was a smoking and a non-smoking section, which of course meant, meant nothing because it's like you're in an airtight container. I mean, I used to love getting on a plane and looking over and seeing an ashtray. Because I'm like, this thing ain't crashing. If it ain't crashed yet, it ain't crashing. This is the safest plane there is. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so turn in. Let's turn from Paxton unless you have- Yeah, it's just some news. Yeah. That, um, well, just uh, anything post-Paxton, anything on the horizon, anything interesting you're working on? We got that you can t talk about. Sure. I mean, we got the verdict on Saturday. I think it was uh, September 16th. Dan and I started a- uh, multi codefendant federal healthcare fraud trial in the Northern District um, that Tuesday. So he leaves Saturday. Obviously, I stayed in Austin that night to yep clean up clean up all to the detox yeah. clean yeah you know yeah. get all put clean up of the house right yeah. space for the next trial. We hopped into a six week trial that Tuesday. Um, Jeez, six weeks, six weeks. Yeah, some type of health. You say yeah. healthcare for us. The, the allegation is so. Uh, so it's resolved. Um, our client was we got a mistrial. Not you know he got really sick during about two witnesses left, and the other three defendants have been convicted. So um, we're kind of like living on a prayer there. Uh, but he really was. I mean, it was to the point where he couldn't even like have a conversation with us about how to do his, you know, properly advocate or talk to us about his defense. So, uh, but the allegation is, it's essentially one of those, it's not a kickback case, but it was um, pharmacist owners paying doctors 
to send prescriptions to their pharmacies. So I actually got to cross-examine the uh, his ex-wife, which was it an amicable re- uh, breakup? <sighs> and so on. That's when it's, that's when it gets fun. Yeah, not an amicable break. Not an amicable breakup. Um, that case is still kind of going on, I guess. So maybe we'll move on. But that was that's that's what, what you did next. That's what I did next, and that was six weeks. So that had to take you pretty far yeah, in the fall. Alice, we were in Dallas for really into well into October. Um, and then we're kind of back now getting our feet on the ground and we're set for a murder trial next. It started on the 30th to pick a jury. November. Yeah. It's so like day to day. Next week. Day to day in the life of criminal defense lawyer, Anthony also. So what is, what do you, what's a week look like that you're not in trial? So, I mean, we're, our firm, the structure is a little different. We're a little bit more boutique style. We don't take, we don't, our intake's not as big. Do you co-counsel with a lot of people? Uh, on the federal stuff, we will. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and state court stuff. I'm handling uh, a sexual assault of a child case with uh, another lawyer, um, Mike Schneider, who was formerly a judge. And uh, But definitely on the federal stuff, we ha- we oftentimes have co-counsel. Um, but day-to-day, I might be in court. And if I'm not in court, I'm at the office working, getting ready for the next trial. So we're full speed ahead. We just recently, I recently announced that we're willing to take PI cases and would like to. I don't, I've never really been involved in PI and neither is Dan, but I have some advisors. Yeah, give me a call. I'll send yeah. you whatever you need. Uh, and then I'll make it, so, I'll make it sound so complicated that if it's good, they send it to me. You got to refer it out. They're like, man, he knows really what he's doing. I'm getting on Facebook every day. You know, I, that's very excited. I'm like, hmm, maybe we're not doing something we should be doing. <laughs> that will when Bill, when Bill says he may make it sound too complicated, he, so you refer it. There's no doubt he will. Well, to be fair, most of my cases are kind of complicated. That's true. You'll get you'll get a but yeah no if you minute slap yeah but if y'all do have discovery all that stuff I'll send you everything you need. Let me know. But yeah, uh, court or just working on cases. Um, see what happens when Kyle doesn't come. Yeah, he all the business, all kinds of business. Yep, yeah. Kyle. Usually, me and Kyle have to argue y'all, about it on the federal stuff. Do you? Will you have to write a lot on that stuff? So yes, we we, we have a, um, another lawyer, uh, Brent Newton, that helps us out with a lot of the writing. He's an appellate-minded guy. Uh, he's a teacher as well. Um, so he's definitely spearheading that. But one of the things about federal these federal trials, for instance, getting ready for an insider trading trial um, that's regarding commodities trading, like oil and gas. They don't. There's not. They don't really have how to defend a commodity trading case 101 in law school. So oh, like a lot of me getting ready for trial is me going through a hundred PowerPoint slideshow of what is commodity trading. What's, what's, a, what's a commodity? How do you trade it? How do you do it wrong? It's very different than the stock market. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Changes. So these are things that I'm going to have to know about and Dan's going to have to know about when we go to cross-examine these traders and, and uh, cause you know, on the federal side, a lot of times you have, if you're going to trial, there are typically a bunch of people that have probably cooperated mm-hmm. and are now testifying against you. Snitches. So, we call them snitches. That may be if it's healthcare or it's an exchange, got to be ready to talk about the ins and outs of, of whatever business it is that they do. So uh, I like, like, that's an interesting facet of what we do. It's interesting that, because, you know, we have this business course now in state court in Texas. Because the idea was like, look, jurors, no offense to them, but most of them are not sophisticated business people. Just that's a population of the world. <clears throat> so let's have this business core where these specialized judges who are experienced do it. You don't have that in on the criminal side, even though there's a lot of particularly federal. Well, in the federal side, you're usually. Well, the judges are, but the juries, I guess, are not. I don't, I mean, I don't think any, the, the, you're going off the law, right? And the average person's supposed to know the law, supposed to understand it. So I. Good. I get it to me, and you only have to convince eight federal court. So that's the, nice. the scheme of it all. Understanding like a complex, if they don't understand the actual allegation, though, sometimes I think that cuts against a defendant. If they can't grasp what the concept was, but they hear, "Oh, well, how much money did they make as a result?" Yeah. They're like, "Yep, beyond a reasonable doubt, done." Exactly. Yeah. So that suggests the story that the jury didn't decide, you know, what the evidence is. They decide which lawyer they like better and that side wins. I'm a firm believer at trial, 
both if you're at trial both cases have got problems both sides sure. and it literally 90 in my opinion 90 percent of the time it comes down to who they like more as a as lo, like lawyer wise whose lawyer do they like more that's where they're going to go i i agree i agree a lot with that in state court i think when you're when you're in federal court at least on the criminal side of things um u.s attorney's office goes a little bit further yeah it's interesting if if there are a lot of great lawyers there, but even if they're not, uh, or it's main justice or whoever's prosecuting your case, it's just, it can be death by a thousand paper cuts. Sometimes. Well, the, the federal judges can take a more active role or typically do, and that can kind of put a, kind of sway things a little bit depending on how they operate. I've got a couple names in mind that I will keep to myself, but yes. No, Judge Hittner. <laughs> David Hittner, Hittner, he... Cut me off mid cross, the most important witness, and did a 35 minute cross, completely irrelevant facts that he was just curious about, and then was like, "All right, let's go to lunch." I'm like, "I'm I'm kind of in the middle here, like what? Uh, it's okay." So Russian. went to lunch. What kind of case was it? Uh, it was a medical product liability case. It was this device that they put on people's feet, a chiropractor. Uh, put it on somebody's feet and had all these LED lights to wake up the nerves for people with neuropathy that couldn't feel their feet. Uh, did not. And these people that couldn't feel their feet then got, he burned his heel. Didn't, couldn't feel it. And then he went back to his construction job and his boots for days and never really thought to look on the bottom of his heel. And he had this huge ulcer that got infected. Ended up having to amputate both legs. Yeah. Well, that's not, that's not a positive thing to end with. Or stop a man in his. I, I won. Okay. That's and, yeah, yeah, we won, and and it well, it went up on appeal. So I was that was when I, my career in federal court got ruined, in my opinion. So we had the first trial, got poured out, all kinds of problems. Um, went up to the Fifth Circuit. I made some great law on that Cairo. It came back down, and there was an issue where the judge was going to have to recuse himself for things we didn't do. Mm -hmm. The defense hired his clerk. Uh, during the appeal, they hired his clerk that was there during trial. And there's case laws very specific and clear on it. And so he's like, you know, Mr. Ogden, how many years have you been? And I'm like, oh, should I stand up. I'm like, he's like, how many years have you been in federal court? I'm like, th th three. And he's like, what about you, Mr. Farah? He's like, 14. And you could see that the judge thought I was the older of the two. He did not think Kyle was the partner and I was the associate. And he was like, Oh, and he's like, well, you, he's like, fine, I'm recused, but you go ask everybody in this courthouse what you just did to your career in federal court. And I was like, I looked at Kyle, I was like, thanks a lot, man. I was like, I only got four years in and you just ruined my career. <laughs> it's a running joke now, but I, fra I, I framed the uh, transcript that I ordered from that hearing just in case I need it. That's good. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, law clerk on your side is a good thing. I think that that's true. Oh, true. Yeah. And if the clerk is... For sure. So this this guy was kind of indifferent. One during the appeal, he went to V and E, I think, and then random company decides to hire him as their like in house local. Right. Um, and th there's the case law is very specific that you can't. It was automatic sanctions for the lawyer for not doing the conflicts check and automatic uh, recusal of the judge. And we were like, Judge, we don't we're not looking to sanction him. He's been a lawyer for like four days. But we do have to recuse, and he was not happy with us. Oh well, well with that, we'll we'll stop, take a break on this little section, and we'll start up after our break with some news stories. And just remember, if you like the Dirty Verdict podcast, please like, subscribe. What else do we do? What? What else do we do? Like, subscribe, follow, follow re YouTube. Uh, YouTube, Spotify, Instagram? Apple, Instagram, TikTok. I think TikTok. What, what, what's all I got? How about word of mouth? Tell your friends. Yeah, word of mouth. Whatever. Just check it out. We try to be useful and helpful and interesting. Uh, so follow us along. I don't. Along. I don't try. I just am. Pete, you, you just can't help yourself. All right, we're gonna take a break. We'll be right back. Eighty-two episodes. <laughs> 